Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the University of Oxford. We're going to give you uh, a, a nice talk tonight, I hope. My name is Lauren Fletcher. I am an engineer with uh, NASA, uh, but I'm currently in Oxford working on a doctorate in planetary physics and exploration, and I am going to talk to you quite a bit about uh, the different types of projects that uh, I'm working on, as well as talking about the potential for life in our universe and why we should expect to be able to find it. So I'm going to go ahead and start on um, the presentation first and then from the presentation I'm going to uh, maybe show you a little bit about our lab and, and certainly you'll have a chance to ask questions as well. We're going to talk about the characterization of the habitability of Mars, uh, its rationale, what we're doing and why, what sorts of methods we're using to be able to characterize the habitability and different types of technology. So as you can see uh, from uh, Spirit Rover, uh, well, five years ago, uh, I need to replace that with the current one, Curiosity, but you can see Mars is, a, is an interesting landscape, but there's not much there. It's, it's rather dry, there's not a lot of water, there's certainly no plants, no elephants or Bulgarian tanks running around on the surface, although I hear Raicho uh, is really trying to get a tank to the surface of Mars, and, and I, I wish him luck on that. Um, so a little bit about me. Well, I have a degree in engineering physics. This is really a double degree. It's one degree in physics combined with a second degree in engineering, and we do it all in one, one time, and it's a lot of work, but it's actually quite a, a good background to go on to do this sorts of, of research for NASA and, and other types of organizations. Uh, following that, I received a, a, a master's in environmental engineering from Stanford, uh, and now I'm currently working on a doctorate in physics at Oxford. Uh, since 1993, I've been working for NASA. Yes, I know it's been 20 years, and I hate to I hate to realize that myself. Um, but it's been a great opportunity, and I've been able to do all sorts of different things, including living in several uh, countries, which includes uh, Peru for just about four years, and I'm just starting my fourth year here in England. Uh, and then in my spare time in the undergraduate, I, I dealt blackjack in the casino as, as one of the interesting things I did. Here in Oxford, I do have other interests besides just science and engineering and exploration. One of them is uh, the Oxford University ski team, and as you can imagine, there's not much snow in England, so what we do is we put these big plastic carpets out on the hill, and we, we ski down those, and we call it skiing. Yes, I know, I know, it's, it's, it's quite silly, but it's a lot of fun. And then uh, every chance I get, I, I try to kill a Cambridge zombie because they, they tend to perpetuate themselves and we do our best to get rid of the Cambridge zombies. But make no mistake about that, I don't believe that my survivability in the zombie apocalypse is all that great. Uh, as you can see, at the end they took me out and, well, well, it was, it was ugly. It was ugly. So what I really want to talk to you about today is life. But not really just life. Uh, or and certainly not life from Earth, I want to talk about life elsewhere. And so the thing is, is that there is no alien conspiracy. NASA is not going to bring out aliens that they've been hiding for decades. And, well, you know, I'm supposed to be an expert, so I'm going to try to tell you, um, you know, why we don't have them. But believe what you're going to believe, but they're not there. But think about it. Imagine that it is uh, 2020, so seven years from now, and we have the next set of rovers on the surface, and we're digging under the surface. And think about what sort of uh, headlines you're going to see in the newspaper. When it says, life on Mars, what do you really think that means? I mean, what is life? You really have to start to think about and consider what is the basic fundamental understanding of how we view life. Is it going to be these sort of really fantastic sorts of landscapes where you have these amazing sorts of plants that we've never seen before? Uh, you know, that's, that's one version of what life might be. So maybe you think about that when, when you think about what life might be beyond the Earth. Or, or maybe you think about these sorts of high-altitude landscapes. Carl Sagan at one point in some of his books and others, other biologists, have, have hypothesized the idea that you would have these these 
atmospherics, you know, these black gaseous giants where certainly you couldn't have anything on the surface, but maybe way up in the atmosphere you would have these sort of balloon type creatures that evolved and they ride the, uh, the atmospheric currents around looking for their food and their water sources. Uh, and maybe that's kind of what you think about life. Or maybe you think about fluffy kittens. Or maybe you think about more fluffy kittens. But maybe you think about zombies. But, you know, we already know that if a zombie were to eat me, it would continue moving. But is it really alive? So is a zombie alive? I don't know. You make the decision. Is that life or not life? Or what about a toaster? Probably not this kind of a toaster or or probably not toast either, but maybe the stuff that made the toast might have been alive. Or maybe this kind of a toaster. So if you're a fan of Battlestar Galactica, you know, the original series on the left moving to the new series uh, from the middle and the right, and you have this sort of Cylon evolution where you won't go, went from purely mechanical sentient life forms to a hybrid of mechanical biological life form. Is this life? Well, it's certainly not the way we view life, but maybe we're being sort of terrorists, as it were, terrorists, like uh, racists, but for Terra, Terra being Earth, so terrorists. Uh, and uh, maybe you're thinking about it from a biological perspective of just the, the, the microbiology. Microbiology would be a great find on another planet. We would love to see that because really at the end of the day, we know one thing about life and one thing only and that we are that life. There is no other life. There is no other example of life that we know of. We've been looking. We're looking hard. We have all the things in the right places, certainly within our own solar system, to try to find life. And so far, we have not been successful. So we have a mystery. Where is life? And why should we expect to be able to find life? Why should we possibly have any hope that we're going to find life beyond the Earth? Well, there, there's a lot of things out there that we can use to convince ourselves that probably we have some, some a good, uh, we should be hopeful. Now, first of all, water. Water is absolutely everywhere. So if you look in the, the upper left, we know that uh, at the early formation of the Earth, 3.8 billion years ago, we had a lot of our water was actually brought to the surface of the Earth through comets, through deposition of cometary material that was arriving to the Earth in the early formation of our solar system when there was a lot more material out there, a lot more material that was arriving at a, at a bulk concentration, and that is pretty much how we got water on the surface of the Earth. So, so comets have a lot of water. We know that. Uh, we also know that on Mars in your upper right, we know that from the Phoenix mission, and this is an image underneath the Phoenix, Phoenix lander after it landed and, and the uh, retro rocket engines blew away that top surface and they exposed a nice layer of, of water ice. So we know that Mars has a lot of, of water ice. In fact, some of the most recent results, in fact, this very week, uh, new uh, data was um, uh, released for the Curiosity rover in which they are currently believe that the amount of bulk water within the bulk soil is at about 2%. So think about this. If you have a cubic meter of soil from Mars, you should be able to pull out about 2 liters of water. So that's actually, that's quite a bit. That's not bad. You could actually do something useful for that with that. And then the moon on the lower left, we know there's a lot of water there, water ice. It's hidden uh, both under the surface, but it's certainly hidden in the, uh, the, the, the sides of craters where it's protected from the light of the sun, uh, and we have, we have actual water ice that we, we've, we've noted there. And then at the far bottom right corner, we have actually used a spectral signature to detect water uh, in other galaxies as far as 11 billion light years away. If you take a look at the, the center image, what you have is our own solar system where the sun is in the center, and then you can see the, the yellow rings, and the yellow rings are, are you know, basically the, the paths of our own planets. And 
what you can see is, is that whole blue layer around the outside, the, inner, the inside has been cleaned out through gravitational forces of both the planets and the sun. But as you get farther away and you lose the gravitational pull of, of the sun, then you have all of this material out there, which is called the Oort cloud. And a fair amount of that Oort cloud is actual water, which is you know frozen chunks of water in the form of comets, but, but they're out in that Oort cloud. So there's a lot of water out there. So the conclusion is, is that there's lots and lots of water. Water is a principal ingredient of life as we know it here on Earth. And we can be a lot more confident that there is the potential for life out there knowing that there is that much water. Now, organic material is the next important item. So you, you can't, it's not just water. You have to have a viable source of energy. You have to have a, a viable source of proteins that can be uh, uh, brought to a location through different sorts of uh, or, uh, prebiotic uh, processes. Now, if you take a look at the very top of the left hand, what you see is the formation of a uh, typical um, planetary system. You can see uh, the star planet formation. Uh, the star, the star and planet starts to form. I'm, I'm sorry. Let's let's start with the the stellar death and mass ejection. So a sun blows up. You know this is this is long after the formation of of the universe, after the Big Bang. So now you have uh, a, a star dies and basically it sends out all of its material into uh, the the local you know area. Now, local area could be, you know, a light year across. Uh, what ends up happening is, is that uh, over time, all of that material would start to form this diffuse medium. So the the gravitational uh, forces of that material, because the material, even though it's a little more distributed, will have a certain amount of gravitational forces, and what ends up happening is it gets denser and denser, and then little particles start sticking to each other, and they form bigger and bigger components, and then eventually get to the point where it's dense enough that you have a new star form, and then the planetary system that, that's around it. Now, a lot of the material that also gets kicked out so that you have the gravitational spin and and you know how our planets are are spinning around our own sun well that's pretty typical you have this rotation of material and those rotational forces will spin some of that material out of its own uh, solar system and so that material can be delivered to another planetary system ours in our case exogenous delivery and that would be delivered to the surface and we know like I said previously that we had a lot of that cometary type of material delivered to the Earth's surface for which we built up most of the amount of water that we currently have on the Earth as a result of that well at the same time that same comets are, are arriving at Earth they're bringing not only water but they're also bringing this organic material. Now, in addition to that, planetary processes at the bottom of that image shows you that as you have a volcanic outgassing or hydrothermal vents, uh, you can actually form uh, organic material through those sorts of processes, including uh, what we'll talk about in a little bit, Miller-Urey synthesis. So once again, the same image that we had from the previous slide on the right, where you have the Oort cloud, the Oort cloud is full of water and it's full of uh, organic material. So we know that we've got water, we know that we've got organic material, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and so we should expect that you should have water and the organic material proteins that would be necessary to form um, uh, life or the form that provide for the basis of life. But if you have those prebiotic materials, which are organic compounds, now the question is, is how do you get to complex molecules that would actually form the basis of life, complex molecules that you need for life? So this experiment was performed by Stanley Miller and, um, uh, da, 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 let's see, it was, uh, yeah, St uh, Stanley Miller and, and Yuri who uh, ran this experiment in 1952. Now you see the picture of him right there. Right next to his head is sort of a, a, a bulb. It's a glass uh, container. And what they did was they put a uh, solution of water and these prebiotic organic materials within that ball. And then they filled the top of it with a CO2 gaseous mixture. And so basically what that was was 
a, a, a simulation of early Earth. So you had water, you had a CO2 atmosphere, you had or all of these organic materials that were within our own system. We know this was there. We've, we've, we've been able to chart that through uh, scientific exploration here on our own surface. And then in order to form complex materials, they hit that same surface with a little bit of energy, like they simulated the lightning strike. And then what they did was is they scraped the gunk that was formed on the side of that glass ball, and they analyzed it. And what they found was more than 20, uh, uh, more than 20, including most of the 20 naturally occurring um, amino acids. Now these amino acids are uh, fundamental basis for life, and so they sh were able to show that you can actually quite easily form complex molecules. And in fact, in the comets as they go around the sun, when they start getting heated up, even though they're not in a, in, a, in, a, in a planetary atmosphere, because there's the organic material in there, because there's water in those comets, just the energy from the sun alone as it gets close enough to the sun is enough to cause more complex organic molecules to form. And so we now know that you've got the water and the organic compounds, and it's much, much easier to form complex molecules than we thought, uh, and so we, th we do believe that uh, it's, it's much easier to form life, or at least to have all the things that you need to have for life. Uh, and so certainly one of the most important things was in 2008, uh, a researcher, Jeff Botta, who was a research student for Stanley Miller. Um, Jeff Botta, who is an acid researcher, he inherited the lab from Stanley Miller, and as Jeff was ending his career, he was cleaning out his laboratory, and he found a whole bunch of vials that were, were closed and properly sealed, and he looked up in the notes, and it turned out that these vials had come from uh, Miller-Urey experiments, but it was a second generation of those experiments. And the interesting thing was is that Stanley Miller and, and Yuri had never actually properly analyzed the 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 second um, the second generation of those those vials. They had published their first results. They certainly got lots of notoriety and they became famous for those experiments. And they left it at that, even though they'd done a second round. So so Jeff, with his uh, follow on exp uh, when he found those, he took those to the laboratory and he reanalyzed those uh, and he found, I'm so sorry, he found 20 of the, of most of the 20 naturally occurring. Stanley found 11 of the 20. I, I, I skipped ahead. Uh, and so Jeff Botta found a lot more because he had a lot better equipment than Stanley Miller had to do the analysis and it turns out that it's much, much easier than Miller had even uh, anticipated in the original experiments and so that it continues to build in us more confidence that we should be able to expect to find life out there. So now let's talk about uh, another piece of the puzzle. We're going to talk about the Murchison meteorite. Now the Murchison meteorite uh, is a carbonaceous conondrite, is a remnant of the early solar system as it was formed. Uh, and so this had been floating out there for about they expect 3.8 billion to 4. Point billion years, and it eventually landed in uh, Antarctica, and it was picked up, and it was analyzed. And what they found inside that meteorite was 411 different organic compounds, including 74 amino acids, eight of which are in proteins of living organisms, and more importantly, uracil and xanthane, which form the basis of RNA and DNA. Okay, so wow, now we got a meteorite that is actually delivering uh, fundamental components to RNA and DNA. You got water, you got organic materials, and you got the building blocks, basic building blocks, uh, starting building blocks for RNA and DNA. And so that again continues to tell us that the, the potential for finding life elsewhere is much better. Now, the last piece of the puzzle is, is that it's great to have all of this material. It's great to have uh, the comets that have your water and have your organic material. It's great that you have material uh, meteorites that are delivering the fundamental building blocks for RNA and DNA, but they have to have some place to live. You can't just form life without some sort of a body. So the question at that point is, is that certainly thinking about a good place to house life, Earth, 
we can say one of the things that we know and what we like to see is a planetary body that has the right conditions for uh, liquid water most importantly. So we start with any planetary body and then we start to think about how many of those planets actually have the capability to support life? Are they habitable? And in our terms and definitions, we want to see planets that are in a distance from their sun. Now remember, each sun, they have a little bit different light output. They can be hotter or they can be colder. And so the distance a planet has to be from that sun in order to have liquid water on its surface changes according to the type of star. And so what we're, we've been taking a look at, or, or a lot of researchers, not we, me, and Oxford, but a lot of researchers have been looking for, are all of these exoplanets. Where are they? How close are they sun? And can they possibly have liquid water, which would, be habitable, which would mean that it would most likely be habitable for, for a life as we know it, at least? Well, to date, we have more than 900 confirmed planets in other star systems. And some are incredibly exotic. There are certainly gas giants, many gas giants. Uh, we have super-Earths, uh, planets that are, are rocky like our Earth, uh, that are anywhere uh, seven to nine times the size of our Earth. Um, and we have ones that are actually down to about one and a half times the size of our Earth, where our limits at the moment our, our capability to resolve the much smaller bodies. But we expect that we would find, based on the current rate of discovery, nearly 30 billion Earth-like planets in our own galaxy in just the Milky Way. 30 billion in just the Milky Way, and we have 100 billion galaxies out there. So you do the math. Now, if you have that many places that could potentially uh, provide habitable conditions, and we know there's that much water out there, and we know there's that much organic material out there, and we know that the building blocks for, for life can be formed in these types of meteorites, then the potential to have life in, around the, the universe is really high. Now, the difference between life as a microbe and life as a complex organism is significant, but we can at least begin to think and believe that the potential for microbial life is really, really good. Uh, and so we have cautious hope. We got the organic material, we got the water, we had the organic soup experiments with the amino acids, uh, we have the Murchison meteorite which provides the building blocks for RNA and a significant number of exoplanets including a large number of known rocky planets which is increasing uh, as we speak and so we have a cautious amount of hope. So that's great stuff. Uh, now let's let's bring it close to home. Rather than looking for life everywhere, let's start with places where we could actually go directly to look for life. Now, now I, I'd like to think that in, in the next generation we're going to be able to create starships that will take us to other galaxies and, and planets far, far away, but at least we can start nowadays to take a look at different locations within our own solar system to see whether or not they are either habitable or whether or not there might actually be life. So where where can we look in our own solar system that might be interesting? Well, Mars is a dead giveaway. We know that there was past liquid water. Um, it's potentially that there are organics, and I'm going to go into that later. Uh, but we definitely know that it consumes organics because it's a it's a highly oxidized environment. Because it's red, we know that that different materials there have been oxidized. So we're not well. I'll get to the organics. Okay, so so Mars is one potential. Uh, Europa around Jupiter uh, is also potential because it has a large subsurface ocean. Now we know again that that those same sorts of materials, exogenous materials, which were arriving to Earth, were most definitely arriving to all the other planets in our solar system. So therefore, it's very likely that you would have organics in that subsurface ocean. So there's a good choice. Now Enceladus around Saturn um, is a very high choice, and the reason for this is that it also has uh, subsurface water, and the reason why we know this is because there's these jets of water that high pressure on the subsurface jet water out, and you can see in that image there, uh, there's a little bit of light to the to the lower 
uh, left side of the planet of Enceladus, and it looks like little streaks. And what that actually is is an image of Enceladus where we can show those jet streams of water shooting out from the surface, and we're able to use uh, a, a spectrographic signature to determine that uh, not only is, is it liquid water, but there's organic material within it, and most importantly, nitrogen, which is really critical to life overall. Uh, and so there you go. You got liquid water, you got organics, you got nitrogen. Wow, now that really looks good because we know all the right things are there in the right place. Mars is great because it, it, it had liquid water in the past, but the conditions today don't appear to be sufficient to support life at this moment, not at the surface. So it's not as good as someplace like Enceladus. Uh, now, Titan around Saturn has it's liquid. Uh, now, liquid, not water, it's liquid ammonium. Now, from our perspective, life needs to have a liquid medium. We understand life here on Earth. We have to have water in order for life as we know it here on Earth to survive. But if you have a more exotic form of life, it's entirely possible that that exotic form of life could survive on ammonium as its fundamental basis. So it has liquid uh, ammonium and organics. So, eh. Potentially, but you know that's not what we understand life right now. So it's a little hard to hypothesize what that life would look for, look like. And so it, it may or may not make sense for us to go look there until it's really the last choice that we have. So Enceladus, that's really great. We like that. Mars, not so bad. But the big problem with Europa, Enceladus, more so than Mars, is, is that they're real. I'm sorry, they're really far away from the Earth. Mars we can get to in six to nine months, you know, but, you know, Enceladus, Europa, these are, you know, 15, 20-year missions by the time you begin to select it, you propose it to your agency and say, hey, we really want to go to Enceladus because it's a great location. Scientifically, they're going to say, yeah, that's great, it's a great idea, but programmatically, they're going to say, man, it's going to take us 15 years just to build the instrument to make sure that it works, and it takes like six or seven years to get out there. It's going to be 15 years before we get there, and then uh, by the time you actually do any real science, it could be even longer than that. And the next thing you know, you've got these you know, 15 and 20-year missions where the starting scientists have reti retired long before they even got to analyze the data. So those, those, those outer planets are very hard to do uh, programmatically right now just because there's, it takes so long to get there. Now, hopefully in the coming years we're going to see different types of propulsion systems like ion propulsion which could cut that transit down significantly. Uh, for instance, if you were to uh, combine an ion propulsion system with a fusion energy source or maybe even fission, but certainly fusion, you could just on the numbers get to Mars in 10 days. I know, amazing. You go from nine months to 10 days just by switching out that propulsion system and you can imagine that you would be able to get out to Enceladus or Europa in a couple of months and that really changes the entire dynamic. So, so we may have to wait till we actually get much, much better propulsion systems before we can really significant, uh, you know, seriously think about doing those types of missions on Europa and, and Enceladus. But in the meantime, we can at least get to Mars and that's what most of the up and coming missions are all about. So, that said, Mars is what we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk. Now, Mars had been uh, certainly an object uh, we have been looking at forever. It's one of the few celestial planets that you can see with the naked eye. You don't need to have a telescope. You can just go out to the night sky and you can see that. You can see it from the surface. And so, you know, for thousands of years, literally thousands of years, uh, humans have been talking about and thinking about Mars. Uh, one of the earliest examples of, of Mars in, in literature, or at least in recorded information, is uh, in uh, 1880 BC in Egypt, the, uh, the star cartographer or astrologist for the current empress of, of Egypt, uh, in his tomb, he had uh, a series of star charts that showed Mars and the other visible planets. And so, so they already knew about them, and, you know, that's 3,000 years ago. Uh, we'd already been thinking about that. Uh, and we know that, that we had the, uh, the, the Greeks who had been thinking about life on other planets. They suspected Mars, and they even talked about 
conditions on Mars and water potentially being different on Mars uh, in order to support life and uh, probably uh, well, anyway, so, so as you go through in time and history, definitely we know that people have been thinking about life within our solar system, Mars in particular, and so one of the earliest missions to look for life and to start to see, to see it after the advent of telescopes in the 1880s, uh, because in the 1880s uh, we had uh, Schiaparelli, an Italian, who had talked about these canali on, on the surface of Mars, uh, and uh, after that uh, there was lots of conjecture about how Martians were building these canals to, to bring water from the north down to the equatorial regions so, so that they could grow their, their plants because they, they knew that Mars was mostly cold and dry, but they knew there was water because at the at the polar caps because they could see it in their telescopes, and so they 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 hypothesized that there might actually be these green belts in the in, in the equatorial regions of Mars. And so one of the first things that we did when the U.S. sent Mariner four in 1965 was to take images of the surface, and unfortunately all we saw was this barren, dry surface, and our hopes of finding liquid water at the surface were dashed. Uh, in 1965, and that's really a pity. So, that was our first real exploration of Mars, 1965, but we certainly had lots of hope, and we sent lots and lots of missions after that. So, why Mars? Well, you know, as we as we know, there's evidence for, uh, for past liquid Mars, and so that image, the, the first globe with all of those canals, that's the famous uh, uh, Schiaparelli uh, globe that shows you the different canals, and so we could see those uh, well enough with the telescopes, and so they drew a map of Mars. Um, and so we had thought about that, but, but we found out actually that today, in the center object, it's actually uh, dry. But if you go back far enough, 3.8 billion years ago, you actually have evidence for past liquid water. So we know that at 3.8 billion years ago, at the same time life was, was forming on Earth, the conditions on Mars were not really all that dissimilar to what we were finding here. A much sick, thicker CO2 atmosphere, liquid water on the surface, uh, but over time it went from the warm wet Mars image on the right uh, to the center image, which was the cold, dry Mars. But we know there was liquid water in the past. We know that it had a thick CO2 atmosphere within two. And so, at the very least, even if the conditions on the surface today aren't sufficient to support life, we know that there is a potential, at least for the preservation of the evidence of life. And so, we'd like to at least find past life. A little bit about Mars. Well, this is important because we have to understand what were the conditions that went that led Mars when it was a warm and wet Mars to its current dry and cold conditions. Well, it's one tenth the mass of Earth. Uh, there's no plate tectonics, uh, less gravity, and no magnetic field. Now, now, what you have to understand is is that as Mars is forming or any planetary body forms, it starts as off as a big blob of very hot, molten, especially rocky planets, not gaseous giants, but rocky planets, it has like a molten mass of, of, of stuff. And as it cools, you get that shell on the outside of the planet, but in the inside, you would have, you know, a very solid core, but you would have, uh, you would have your magma on the outside of that, and you'd eventually get to your outer shell. Well, on the Earth, uh, those the, our outer shell breaks in the form of plates, and we have these plate tectonics. Now, a little bit of the, this has to do with the fact that the Earth has a moon, and as the moon is, is in orbit around the Earth, it tugs on it with its gravity, and that helps maintain the rotation of the liquid magma on the subsurface, and it also helps tug on those plates so that they continue to move around. Well, this is good because it's kept us as an active planet. Uh, as an active planet, that means you have volcanic activity. The volcanic activity spews out more uh, of the organic molecules like sulfates, uh, and this is important to maintain a, 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 an active 
biosphere, a potential, all the, all the things that you need to maintain a, an active biosphere. But Mars didn't have this. It didn't have its own moon, so there was no plate tectonics. Its, its liquid core is basically solidified. Without that liquid core rotating, that means you're not going to generate a, a full planetary magnetic field. And so without a magnetic field, uh, which is what is the principal item that protects our atmosphere from all of the solar flux which comes from the sun. The particles out of the sun as they're admitted, they have a lot of force and a lot of energy and as it passes across the earth, it'll strip your atmosphere away. But because we have the magnetic field that protects our atmosphere, Mars doesn't have this. And so there's a variety of things that the scientists believe, including lack of a moon, lack of uh, magnetic fields uh, to protect the atmosphere that strip that atmosphere away. And as soon as you strip that atmosphere away, you lose the, the capability to protect uh, the liquid water. It gets colder, it freezes off, and everything goes away. And then you end up with a cold, dry Mars, which is what we see today. OK, so, so where have we sent missions since 1965? Now, what we're seeing here are most of the places that the US has sent missions. Now, keep in mind that the Russians also were able to land a couple of missions on, on Mars, and uh, the, the, the United Kingdom managed to, well, they managed to crash one on Mars. They, they're, they're, they're getting better. It's, it's really hard. Mars is hard. There's a lot of missions that have gone, but a lot of missions that have failed. And the U.S. has just sent so many that our, our, our success rate is based on the fact that we, we keep sending more and more. Uh, but we have been quite successful. You have the two earliest landers, which were Viking 1 and 2. You can see those. Uh, and then you went to Mars Pathfinder. Uh, and then you went to Opportunity and Spirit as the rovers. And Phoenix. And then followed by in Gale Crater is where Curiosity rover is. So that's that's mostly where we have been sending our our missions. And most of the time, we've been sending our missions to places where we believe would be good places to look for the potential to support life today, or at least to have supported life in the past, so that we can look for the preservation of life or the conditions that might be able to support life. On the surface of Mars, we have actually been able to find the evidence for past liquid water. Now, remember, in the Mariner image, there wasn't much there. Now, let's be fair. Mariner 4 didn't have a very good resolution on his camera. That was as good as it gets, the image you saw before. But as you got to later images, you would be able to see these features on the surface of Mars that are basically outflow channels, which are indicative of liquid water in the past. And we're certainly seeing... Um, uh, frozen water on the surface like we saw at Viking where you can see the, 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 the frozen water not too far from the lander. So we know at least we're starting to understand that while the current conditions certainly don't look like they would support life or, or provide for the capability for a genesis of life, at least we know that maybe there might be something there for liquid water or, or frozen water that could support life depending on the conditions as they evolve over time. And certainly there's a lot more ice uh, than, than we had at first uh, thought. So Mariner wasn't all that uh, great of a result for us because it looked like it was completely dry. But as we got more, well, as we have had more and more uh, missions to Mars, both in orbital uh, instruments that will uh, monitor what we're seeing of the surface from orbit as well as uh, surface landers, we're able to see much, much more into the subsurface to convince ourselves there's actually quite a bit more water there than, than we originally saw in 1965. And so you see these polygon features, and the interesting thing about these polygon features is and we see these in the Arctic, we see these in the Antarctic, in, in the dry valleys, Taylor dry valleys, where you have these, these dry surfaces. They look kind of like a desert, but you see kind of like these polygon features in the surface. And what it is is that when water freezes and expands and contracts, it forms a polygon on the subsurface. So that happens here on Earth, and we're certainly seeing those on Mars. And so since we understand how those are formed here on the Earth, we can hypothesize that that's exactly what we're seeing on uh, Mars. So we have these polygons, and they give us a lot more confidence that there's a lot more water wider spread than we had seen in 1965. 
And so looking at this image, this is the image of, of warm, wet Mars. Now, again, one of the reasons why we think that Mars was warm and wet in the past is because, as you can see, the, the, uh, in the northern hemisphere, you basically have an ocean. And what we see are actually the land-ocean interfaces, and it's much like here on Earth. And so if you strip away the water and you look... Uh, okay, so what this image is is that if you put a certain amount of water on the surface of Mars, like 100 meters deep or 200 meters deep, I can't remember what it is, the water naturally fills in onto these features and that forms exactly what we see here on Earth in our ocean, Pacific or Atlantic or Indian Ocean, as it interfaces with the different land masses, it forms these same sorts of features. And so if you just fill in the northern hemisphere with water, that's what you get. And so that gives us confidence, again, that we, we would see uh, that there was wa liquid water in the past on the, on the surface of Mars. Now, even though it's cold and dry today, one of the things that you should understand is, is that Mars rotates on its axis just like the Earth uh, and as it goes around. Now, today, it's at a inclination of 25 degrees. Now, the Earth is also at about 25 degrees. However, unlike Earth, or sorry, I say, uh, Earth is not like Mars in the sense that the axis of rotation actually changes on Mars. It it precesses and it precesses a lot. It goes from about five degrees inclination to as much as forty-five degrees inclination. So what that means is is that when it's at forty-five degrees, the 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 northern pole uh, is actually exposed to the sun almost continuously, and so you get two times more polar summer sunlight, which would allow the, the northern polar caps, which is mostly frozen CO2, not frozen water, frozen CO2, uh, that would allow that frozen CO2 to actually vaporize into gaseous CO2. Now, if you take all of the northern polar cap of Mars and you were to turn that into gaseous CO2, what you would do is you would thicken up the total atmosphere around Mars. And as you thicken up that atmosphere, it provides the capability for Mars to retain more heat just like we see here in climate change. And when you, when you maintain more heat in the atmosphere, that provides more heat, that, cool, that, that releases more CO2. It's a higher pressure. It's a higher temperature. And between the higher temperature and the higher pressure, because of the uh, freezing point uh, of water, the triple point, there is the capability to have liquid water on the surface of Mars when you get to these high inclinations. But it's a very long cycle. And so what you see here in this chart is periods of you have low obliquity, low obliquity being what we want to see, which is, I'm sorry, is what we don't want to see. It could be as, as low as 5 degrees. And then you have this transition in the middle where you have a high obliquity period of anywhere upwards of 45 degrees. Now, you see the very quick change in those within each of those periods. Even though the, the high mean obliquity period looks like it has an average about 30 degrees across that 4, 5 million year period, uh, there are periods even in the high obliquity where it can get down to as low as 25 degrees, uh, which was about what it would be today. But each one of those very sharp up and down points is about a 50,000 year cycle. And what this means is that even if you look on the left side in the low mean obliquity period and you see the very high peaks of those short period oscillations, you would see a obliquity reaching as much as 40 degrees and uh, under those conditions, every 50,000 years, you might see the conditions on Mars to be warm enough to release enough CO2 to have a thick enough atmosphere to maintain liquid water on the surface, which means if you have microbes living on the surface that are frozen most of the time, every 50,000 years for a certain amount of time, it could be hundreds of years, it could be a 1,000 years, it might be just warm enough for those microbes to wake up and metabolize 
and divide, and then when it starts to get cold, they would go back to sleep and they would be dormant until the conditions were right for them to be able to live. So, so what this starts to tell us is, is that it is potential that even under the conditions of cold and dry on Mars today, that there are these periods, at the worst case, in the low mean of liquidity period on the left side, that you would have peaks up toward upwards of 45 degrees that would allow you to have liquid water just long enough to metabolize. And certainly, when you look at the high mean of liquidity period with an average of about 30 degrees, with lots of peaks, uh, across a five million year cycle, that would be more than enough for microbes to happily divide, uh, but probably not enough for microbes to form more complex systems moving from you know, singular, single cell systems to multicellular systems. And so, but, but, but this is good. We like this. We like these data. This is good. This gives us confidence that even though we haven't been able to find life on the surface of Mars right now, that at least maybe subsurface, the conditions could potentially be habitable, and all of the current missions are kind of looking at this question of habitability.